Good afternoon um, to all of you who are online and those are, who are coming online. We've got an exciting lunch and learn for you today. And uh, one of our own uh, Rotarians and um, person who works with us at the clerk's office is going to be our, our speaker today. So, um, show let's let's go this is a a, um, a lunch and learn and so this is a um, uh, we don't have our opening or what have you we just go right into our presentation so um, Mr. Um, Richardson are you ready to go I am ready and raring to go oh, raring and ready to go Okay, but for, for some reason, I'm not seeing what maybe everybody else is seeing. I, I can't see who's on or any of that. But in honor of Black History Month, um, in collaboration with the Maywood Rotary Club, today's Lunch and Learn, um, we're excited to hear from the Honorable uh, Travis Richardson, uh, who currently serves as Chief Legal Counsel for the, the Clerk's Office, but he's also um, one of our um, uh, Rotarians, and he's going to share some information today uh, about someone you may or may not know about. And I'm, I'm really excited about this presentation because I actually had opportunity to learn a little bit about this gentleman uh, during uh, my years in, in graduate school. So Richardson has over 20 years of experience as a highly skilled litigator and negotiator, as a member of a very large uh, law firm and president of his own firm. Um, I think most of you know him. He's got an extensive background. Uh, we're glad to have him. And let's, let's have it for Mr. Richardson. I'll give him the claps right now. So go right ahead, um, counselor. OK. All right, then we're going to um, start off with that first slide, introducing uh, the topic uh, of the day, or at least the primary topic of the day, and that is regarding uh, Mr. Jesse Binga, Chicago's first Black banker. Uh, next slide. Now, Mr. Binga, is originally from my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. He was born in Detroit to William and Adelphia Powers Binga. Uh, he became a Southside Chicago real estate mogul, banker and philanthropist. He traveled the Western territory of the United States between 1885 and 1893 as a barber, a Pullman porter, and real estate speculator. Next slide. He settled in Chicago, Illinois in 1893 and established a fancy fruit and vegetable business right down the street at 12th and Michigan Avenue, from which he operated a shoe shine stand and a huckster wagon. Huckster means things for sale. It doesn't mean that he was involved in nonsense as uh, that terminology may indicate but it was just a, a, a wagon that had different uh, trinkets and doodads for sale. In the late 1890s, he established the J.C. Binga and Company real estate business. Now, the World's Columbian Exposition was in Chicago in 1893, as the last two slides have shown. Uh, Binga um, traveled, as I said before, here and there uh, as a young man, um, and as a Pullman porter. He came to Chicago 
to see the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. And that's where he stayed after seeing all the opportunities for him to earn a living here in our fair city. He also founded the first African-American owned bank, the Binga Bank Private, north of the Allegheny Mountains. He obtained a state charter and opened the Binga State Bank in 1921. There you have, or here we have a photograph of the opening day, January 3rd, 1921. And there's Mr. Binga standing at the center of the photograph. Um, I don't know what the weather was like uh, on that day, but I don't see many coats so it must have been inclement weather for January in Chicago. Next slide, you see people um, outside one of the, uh, the bank's location at 33rd and State Street. This slide shows the biggest state bank, which was founded again in 1908 as a private bank. And this is an advertisement that Binga had in the paper for his bank that was located again on the south side. And this was, though, though, please don't get ahead of me with the, uh, with the slides, I'm still on that one, thank you. It was the uh, most important addition to the Negro business community in Chicago at the time of its opening, down, right down there on State Street. And again, he was operating uh, both the bank and a real estate company. And as you can see, as you, you really, you still see these things, uh, these sorts of advertisements uh, throughout parts of downtown Chicago, where there would be like on the side of a building as before, a, another taller building was, was uh, constructed next to these huge advertising paintings regarding your particular business. You can still see that on certain buildings, particularly with the uh, with a brick facade uh, throughout downtown Chicago. And sometimes there are businesses that closed decades ago, but then that's how long that particular advertisement uh, has been up. All right, next slide. Uh, he opened uh, a, an arcade building at 35th and State in, 1920, uh, in 1929. This is a photograph of that building uh, from 1946. And you'll see there the credit is uh, for from the Illinois Institute of Technology. As we'll see later in the presentation, they purchased uh, much of the property in that area uh, that uh, Binga formerly owned uh, to build the, the university. All right, next slide. So the story of the Binga family begins in late September of 1836, when Anthony Binga Sr. and his siblings escaped from slavery in Campbell County, Kentucky and headed north to freedom. Many of those freedom seekers, including Anthony Binga Sr. and Junior relocated to Ontario. In Detroit, other branches of the Binga family were busy establishing self-contained communities. One of those locales was Binga Row, which was a group of tenement apartments near Ohio and Hastings streets, uh, co-owned by William Binga and administered by his wife, Adelphia. Uh, next slide. Binga Row, was populated largely by escaped slaves 
who did their best to acclimate to their new surroundings and earn a living. While the conditions in Bingo Road were hard scrabble, the apartments were also some of the few housing options open to former slaves in Detroit. In addition, Adelphia Bingo was a very generous woman who reportedly never evicted poor tenants and always made sure that her renters had enough food to live on. Adelphia Powers Binga was an orphan born in New York State. At two weeks of age, she was taken into the woods and given to a Native American medicine woman. Sometime between the ages of 15 and 17, she married escaped slave William W. Binga in 1844 in Detroit, Michigan. She was a wife, mother, produce, entrepreneur, property owner, and manager. Her main vocation was as a midwife and herb doctor who manufactured and sold a medicinal elixir called the Balm of Gilead. The Bingos left Detroit in 1887 settling in St. Paul, Minnesota, where William died in 1890. Next slide, please. Now, Jesse Binga would go on to wed Eudora Johnson, who was the sister of John Mushmouth Johnson in 1912. Her brother was a successful saloon keeper and property owner on the south side of Chicago. Now, that was a unique nickname, Mushmouth, but they called him Mushmouth due to his, shall we say, proclivity for colorful metaphors. He liked to cuss, and that's how he earned the nickname Mushmouth. But you should never underestimate what's behind sometimes that hardened exterior. He was the gambling and policy numbers king of the south side of Chicago. He was a gambling house proprietor, and he made a fortune controlling the city's policy racket and other gambling enterprises. Mushmouth had little formal education before he took a job as a porter in a Chicago gambling house in the 1880s. And although he was not a gambler himself, he learned the business quickly and opened his own nickel gambling house right up on Clark Street. In 1890, he sold this establishment and opened a saloon and gambling house at 464 South State Street that remained in continuous business for 17 years until his death. It was the mark of Mushmouth Johnson's success that he became a partner in the Frontiac Club that was an establishment that catered only to wealthy whites. And Johnson used his money to support race advancement causes in the black community, though his business was seen as a bit disreputable by members of the older black elite who did not want to be connected to any shenanigans. It was estimated that over 2000 people attended Mr. Mushmouth Johnson's funeral service at the institutional church. Now you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about John Mushmouth Johnson? Well, it all ties in together because after his death in 1907, Johnson's wealth contributed to the establishment of a new black business elite when his surviving sister, Eudora Johnson, Mary rising black banker, Jesse Binga in 1912. 
She was a socialite, philanthropist, and one of the wealthiest and most fashionable African-American women in Chicago. She married Jesse Binga on February 20th in 1912. Her inheritance from her brother helped her husband to augment his real estate and banking business. She inherited over $200,000 from her brother. And that translates in today's numbers to almost $6 million. This money was merged with Binga's bank and its capitalization, making it as a result, the biggest bank among Chicago's Black Belt communities. With Chicago's population explosion, the Binga Bank was in full swing in the 1920s. And within a few short years, the bank had deposits of well over a million dollars, which translated into an estimated uh, over $37 million today. She was a world traveler, art collector, and businesswoman. And she and her husband, Jesse, sponsored the Champion Magazine, which, will, which served as a writing vehicle for her nephew, who was a poet, and other Black artists at the time. Next slide, please. In 1927, Binga purchased property at 35th and State and built an even grander structure, the Binga Arcade, which was a half million dollar five story modern office building, which would house all of the Binga empire, as well as offices for other black owned businesses. There was no building anything like it south of Van Buren in the loop. During this period, income among African Americans in Chicago was growing substantially and Jesse Binger was a leading symbol of the community's hopes. His success made him a celebrity. He wrote weekly columns on business and real estate for the Chicago Defender and published a book entitled Certain Sayings of Jesse Binga. Next slide. The Binga was somewhat of a maverick and unafraid to do things outside of what was considered the African-American comfort zone in the early 20th century. So you gotta understand in the early 20th century, Jim Crow was in full swing throughout the country. Lynchings were happening on a consistent basis throughout the country. The Supreme Court of the United States had recently decided that the Negro had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. So it was a time of being in your place, staying in your place and staying out of trouble, keeping your head down, uh, laughing when nothing was funny, scratching when you didn't have an inch, dancing when there was no music playing. But Mr. Binga had no such shall we say, proclivities. He dramatically defied Chicago's division of streets where Blacks live or where Blacks were and were not supposed to live. In 1917, he bought a home on South Park Avenue, 5922 South Park Avenue, which as the uh, old timers on the line and those who know their Chicago history know, is now King Drive. And he bought that home in the all white Washington Park uh, neighborhood. Next slide.
1919, one of the deadliest riots in the history of the country took place in the city of Chicago. The police moved blacks out of white neighborhoods. The Benga had no intention of leaving. He hired armed guards and offered a $1,000 reward for information about any bombings of his home or his property. And he told one of the daily news uh, reporters, I will not run. The race is at stake and not myself. Next slide, please. It was said that nobody was bombed more than Jesse Binga. His home was bombed six times and his business was bombed twice. He was threatened by mail and phone he received cold calls trying to get him to move out of white neighborhoods. And he was considered the lightning rod for the 1919 race riots. He received letters after the riots claiming his integration efforts were the cause of the violence. Now, can you imagine a worse case of blaming the victim? People riot in a racist frenzy and then blame Emmett Till, no, I mean Jesse Binga for the destruction of the riot. What Mr. Binga told the Chicago Defender partially in response to criticism from Blacks that he had moved out of the Black Belt I am an American citizen, a Christian, and a property owner. No man can make of me a traitor or a coward. No power on earth can change my faith in God. I will defend my home and personal liberty to the extent of my life. I have just as much right to enjoy my home at Washington Park as anyone else to go there and play tennis or baseball or enjoy other advantages of the district. It is a personal privilege. I went there to live because I liked the house and I had a chance to buy it. I do not want to get away from anybody, but absolutely refuse to live in a neighborhood inhabited by the lower class of white trash. Binga and his businesses survived years of controversy and attack. But unfortunately, Around the corner from his road of success was the Great Depression. And he, like many other business owners, was affected dramatically by the Great Depression, which led to uh, the end of many businesses throughout the country and unfortunately, Mr. Binga's businesses were not immune. And that, that period marked the end of his prosperity as it did once again for so many others, black and white. In 1929, at the, at the apogee or crest of his successful rise, Benga, now in his 60s, began seeking funding for a second bank, this one with a federal charter. 
He purchased additional property in the area of his current bank and sold shares in the new banking enterprise to investors. The following year, however, his banking fortunes fell as the Great Depression began and a stock market crash, excuse me, the Great Depression began with a stock market crash and runs on banks. By the summer of 1930, the bank's cash reserves had dwindled, leading to a suspension of lending activities. Binga dipped into his own pocket, using much of his own personal fortune in an attempt to remain afloat, and this proved futile. In 1933, his wife, Eudora Johnson, suffered a fatal paralytic stroke after the failure of her husband's Benga State Bank. Next slide. Most of Benga's former properties have been demolished and redeveloped largely by the Illinois Institute of Technology. The, this is a picture at the top of the Binga Block, which is a group of storefront apartments located on the west side of State Street between 47th and 48th Street. And he entertained many a black celebrity who came to Chicago including Booker T. Washington uh, and many others. His house at 59th and, and King, more specifically 5922 South King Drive, which was repeatedly bombed by racists attempting to get him to move out still stands and you can drive by it today. Next slide. His Binga State Bank failed after the Wall Street crash of 1929. Mr. Binga died on June 13th, 1950 at St. Luke's Hospital four days after a fall at the home of Albert Roberts, who was his nephew. But he lived a long life, having been born once again in Detroit, Michigan, lived to the ripe old age of 85, and died in his adopted home, home city of Chicago, Illinois, and is buried right out at Oakwood Cemetery on the south side of Chicago. And that's the story of the first black bank and banker in the city of Chicago. Well, now, thank you, uh, Counselor. Uh, we have we do have some questions here. Um, I'm wondering if we can see the people who are asking the questions. One, uh, Bonnie Lipka is asking, what's the address of the Binga home near Washington Park? Okay. Um, I will give you that, and then I'm going to ask you to hold your questions to the very end. Oh, I thought we were done. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I've got a surprise for you. Oh, okay. His, his house, the, the address is 5922 South King Drive. And that house still stands. Thank you. Now, next slide. Now, I thought that in honor of Black History Month, I think that we need to do some educating. Uh, and one, in my presentation last year, I talked about the immortal HeLa cells that are still being used today. Um, that came from an African-American woman whose family was never compensated for the theft and use of those cells. And it, it, it made me think about a speech that a fraternity brother of mine gave at the first, in a, the first inaugural graduation of Teach for America volunteers. 
And he said something that has stuck with me ever since. And I, in looking at what I'm about to show you, I think it, it, it really hits home. And he was telling this throng of a thousand volunteers, most of whom were from outside of the black and brown community, but were volunteering to go into these communities to serve as teachers for at least two years, that it's very important that you develop and support um, and praise and laud excellence in education in the Black community. Because you never know who's sitting in your classroom somewhere in, in, in Inglewood. You don't know who's sitting in your classroom somewhere on the west side of Chicago. The cure for the common cold could be sitting right in front of you, waiting to just be inspired to open a book and to learn. The cure for cancer could be sitting in a classroom on the west side of Chicago with an empty stomach, just waiting for lunchtime because that's the only time they eat all day. You never know. And so in light of that, I wanted to just run off for everyone and then we'll take questions. A list of black inventions. And these are things that we would not have, at least in the incarnation today, without black excellence and black inventors. Next slide. You have the mailbox, the air conditioning unit, the elevator, the fire extinguisher, the ironing board, the automatic gear shift for those who drive, the almanac, the light bulb. Thomas Edison was an incredible marketer. He was a great businessman, but the scientist responsible for his so-called greatest uh, invention, but more like me than Brad Pitt. the light bulb, the stethoscope, the pencil sharpener, the traffic signal, the blood plasma bag, the biscuit cutter, the bicycle frame, a baby buggy, the chamber commode, your clothes dryer, a curtain rod, the doorknob, the door stop, the dust pan, the egg beater, the electric lamp bulb, the fire escape ladder, the folding chair, the fountain pen, the gas mask, the golf tee, the typewriter, the ice cream scooper, the lawnmower, the lawn sprinkler, the lantern, peanut butter, the refrigerator, the rolling pin, the spark plug, the straightening cone, the stove, ice cream, potato chips, the gas heater, 3D movies, the kidney transplant, the folding bed, the x-ray spectrum, excuse me, the spectrometer, laser cataract surgery that we know as LASIK today. Automatic lubricating system made by the real McCoy. The telephone transmitter, the subway system, the roller coaster, chemotherapy, the helicopter and the radiator. This is just a partial list of the many, many things that have been invented by African Americans and that have had an impact on the quality of our lives. So let's be supportive. Let's 
cultivate and inspire the African American community so that these inventions will continue to come and be patented and improve our lives. Thank you very much. And now the floor is open for questions if there are any. Well, I, I see we have, we've been graced with the presence of a, a um, uh, the, where is she? Where'd she go? The, um, there she is. <laughs> okay. Uh, Melissa Conyers Irvin. Um, most of you know, she's the uh, treasurer for the city of Chicago. And I'm glad that she's with us today. Uh, you have a, a Madam, Madam Treasurer, you have a question. Absolutely. Um, first, let me thank you, Clerk Yarbrough. This is a great lunch and learn. Um, this is absolutely awesome especially during Black History Month. And I am so glad that I received the information to join the call today. I'll, I'll tell you to um, Maywood Provisory Rotary Club. I've heard a lot of great things about this club. Um, and it's so good to even see, um, I see Takesha on. And I know that she is, um, I've been knowing her a very long time since we were little girls. And oh, to wow. see her now and in her role and what she's playing with the Rotary Club, this is just absolutely awesome. So thank you for having me today. I'll tell you this, um, Judge Richardson, that was amazing. And especially in my role as city treasurer of Chicago, I'll tell you, I talk about building generational wealth all the time. That's like my mission as treasurer. And I, I mean, please know I'm, I'm going to be doing some social media posts about this. This was so great today. Now you got me even doing more research, but I'm thinking like, I cannot believe that Mr. Binga came to Chicago with $10 in his pocket and was the first person to own a private African-American bank and how that bank helped other Black residents and business owners. So here's something I wanted to, to leave for the club members. And even if you want to chime in, Clerk Yabro or um, Judge Richardson or anyone else on the team. Um, but I was thinking, when I think about his story and how he helps so many others, and, and I, want, I want us to really get that, that when we rise, we, we have to reach back to help others, which Mr. Binga did. But how do we encourage and promote more Black business owners, entrepreneurs, and help them to understand that when they rise, it helps the entire community? Well, Madam Treasurer, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm glad to know that you know Takesha. That's great to know and that you guys have known each other for a long time. And there's a little um, application form that we sent along to you. We would love to have you join us. Um, I tell you, I'm excited about it. This is please. awesome. And I, and I just really thank you all. I think more people need to know about this opportunity. So I thank you that I know about it. And I look forward to being a part of the team. Great. Thank you again, Madam Treasurer. Uh, Sarah, you have a question. Yes, I do. Um, I thought this was super great and, and amazing. But as we know, they are removing a lot of stuff that's associated with black history out of the school system. And in various places, they just had that fight in Florida where they removed a black history class from the AP program, mm. advanced placement program. So how do we get this to our kids? Because I think having this will bring about a lot of pride. How, can, how do we think of that? And what I'm having in my head is how is a rotary um, member, do I think of how we can get Black history out to our kids because it's not, they're not willing to teach it in the school system anymore? Well, we have edu some educators that are members of our club. And so I'm going to either ask um, Bob Lipka or um, I see Sue is on. Um, and anybody else who would like to respond to her question, what can we do? Oh, and is, is Bonnie on too? Oh, Brian, do you have an answer? Oh, there's, there's Sue. Go ahead, Sue. I'm going to say it's very important for parents to become involved with their schools 
and see what their what their curriculum is. It's got to be a partnership. Um, education is not, it's got to be everybody, the school system, the teachers, uh, the parents, the community, all working together. So the first step is to get this uh, partnership with your schools, and then you can um, have more input into what's going into the curriculum or uh, being taken out. Another important step is make sure you know what you're doing with your school boards and a lot of different parts of the state. I mean, it's not something that we're, we're facing and provide so in terms of the censorship, but there are forces out there right now who are working very hard to change the, the culture of our schools and where we are prevented from teaching black history, which is a total sin, total, total sin. And you want to make sure and make sure who's running it, make sure who you're voting for, that their uh, their values are your values. So that's a very, very important thing. I, I wanted to briefly respond uh, to, to that. I think that's a poignant question. It's very important. And I, I, I'm speaking from my, my, my history background now. Um, I think we have to be very careful and vigilant with this sort of uh, behavior and these trends because see, when you start talking about banning books, I see, I don't know what the, the rest of you see, but I see bonfires with people sig hiling. Mm. It's racist, it's anti-Semitic, it's sexist. What it does is narrow down your thought process and allow it allowability to a very select, uh, uh, accepted genre and people. And I think about Martin Niemöller, uh, who was a Lutheran pastor in, in Germany. Germany. Now he started off thinking like Nazis. He actually was a sympathizer. But then Hitler came to power. Now I can imagine being a Republican and then Trump winning. Mm. And he became a, an outspoken critic of Hitler because of his interference with religion and the Protestant church, which is what he was, the Protestant pastor. And he found out what happened when you sympathize and give these people an edge, an end. And he spent eight years in a Nazi prison camp because he found out just how dangerous his boys could be. And he's the one who came up with the quote that many of us have heard in some form or another. And I think we should keep this in mind. It's very important if you value America, if you value freedom. He said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Mm. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. Mm. And there was no one left to speak for me. That's how serious this thing going down, uh, going, going around in Florida is. And if you don't take it this seriously, then you are complicit. Don't wind up like Martin Niemöller spending eight years in a Nazi uh, uh, concentration camp because you thought that this was the right thing to do. This is cool. This is what needs to be done. And you're going to turn around and find out that no one's going to be left to speak for you after you watched everyone else marched into those camps. They're going to turn around and look at you, and you're going to be next. Thank you, Travis. Uh, Marcia, I think that's you with your hand up. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 
So what I was going to say uh, to the question was, how do we get this information to our children? One of the things that I think we also have to understand is that some of that is going to fall on the parents. So the parents are going to have to educate their children on the things that they're not getting in school. And it's not just Black history, and it's not just Asian history, and it's not just um, Hispanic history. It's whatever your culture is, you're going to have to educate your children on that culture because the school can't educate on everybody's culture. And they're not going to give your child the information, not all the information they need, but they're, they're not gonna put that culture aspect and that passion in it that you want them to take away with or to come away with. So for, uh, for me, when I grew up, my mom taught us our history. She taught us our culture. So I, I put it to the parents as well. You know, do be active in your school and see what the school is teaching. And then you supplement that at home. So what they're not getting, you supplement it what, with what you have. And if you don't know it, then you're going to have to educate yourself and work, work with, you know, this says that it takes a village to raise a family. So you may have to rely on the village a little bit. So that would be my suggestion is don't rely solely on the school to take some of that into your own hand and teach your child the culture that they know. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Um, Sarah, you and Marcia can lower your hands. Are there others who would like to speak to that, that question? I think it's a, uh, I think everybody, it sounds like everybody's uh, saying the same thing that one, it starts at home. Um, do your job at home. And then, um, as Sue said, then, you know, it's a collaboration between community, um, uh, schools, and uh, the what, what goes on at home. I mean, your parents are your first teachers. So that's where a lot of this falls. Sarah, you had an idea? Yeah, I have an idea. So let me, uh-oh, hold on. I lost my thing. So here's my idea. Um, and I only have it because I was thinking of it from a different perspective on what we could do and what would what would work well and what wouldn't. In my head, I was thinking, you know, they have those JA programs where they used to have businesses. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You know how they had those JA programs where they had businesses that came in and they did. Um, You're talking about junior achievement? Yeah, like a junior achievement. But here's why I say that because uh, there's a lot of working parents and parents are just, and those parents may not, doesn't know a lot about black history either because they, they've phased it out over the years. Like they've really phased, done a great job of phasing it out of the school system. So I was thinking maybe, I know there's a lot of different things that we could take on or do, but a JA program that kind of says, hey, we're Rotary or it's just an idea similar to that about black history where they can we can either drop it off and the kids can take it home and learn something or we can do something during black history month in february next year and kick off something where we go to a few schools and we use the material provided today and other material to just do a, a ja program something not major maybe an hour that teaches black history for schools that want us or want it i don't know just a thought i was trying to come up with a solution too versus just throwing it out there and say, what can we do? Okay, well, well that's <laughs> great. Yeah, and I'm sure we got a, a bunch of solutions uh, on, on this call. Um, Bob, did you have something you wanted to share? Yes, I, I typed in a few in the chat room, but one in particular we could do close to home and encourage other Rotary clubs around the world to do is to build our uh, ministerial alliance networks. You know, we've got maybe 40 or so pastors in a group in Proviso Township, there's really actually over 120 churches, I think, if I recall correctly. And I think we could actually uh, put Travis and others on uh, uh, their Saturday morning program. We could distribute written resources, bibliographies, and access to other resources for clergy who work through sermons, as well as Sunday schools, as well as communication to their parishioners could help to elevate the knowledge throughout our township. Oh, great idea. Yeah, great idea. Any other comments or questions to uh, Travis? I had a comment, Karen. Go right ahead. I recall, Our next I re yes, it's okay. me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I recall being in high school 
And on career day, Judge Eugene Pynchon came in and spoke to us and told us all about his life. And that, that may have changed like the whole direction of my life, just hearing him speak. And this was during a time when he was representing those uh, young men, the, the young men that were falsely accused of a crime. And I just think that as professionals, when they have career day at school, it would be nice that if, if some of our professionals that's in our community can go and speak on black history topic. That's what Eugene Pinto did. You know, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, I, you know, I think uh, some of us do that. Uh, uh, I think Travis um, this week or last week uh, went into a classroom. Um, Travis, are you still on? Could you speak to that? Uh, yes, it's, I, I, I thanks for the, um, the, the question and the, and the suggestion. I think more of us should do it, but um, I, I'm a former teacher um, and I try to get back into the classrooms. One of the things that I really liked about the daily administration was they had this principal for a day program that stopped you know, after he left office. Uh, but I, I thought it was really good because it gave me the opportunity to go into these classrooms to uh, speak to students about uh, my career and what I was doing. And I, after the first year I did it, I said, you know, Whitney Young doesn't need Travis Richardson, um, and nor do any of these other nice uh, schools where everybody's going to college. I said, send me to your school at the Juvenile Detention Center. And a lot of people don't know there's actually a school at, at uh, 26 in California for the 17 year olds in custody. So when I found out about those, those programs and those schools, that's why I insisted on going to principal for a day. Uh, and uh, this past week, we had the judges go to school program where I went back to my son's old stopping grounds at the Keller Elementary School and uh, read from a book on the life of Harriet Tubman and talked about uh, law, justice, fairness, equality, and so forth. So I still try to do that. I wish more people would do it. Some of us are doing it, but it, again, as I said, you never know who's in that classroom. Uh, the, 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 just to think about the fact that chemotherapy was developed by an African-American female scientist and how many lives that has saved. Mm -hmm. you, you may need develop uh, an illness between now and when you, uh, when you die. And the thing that, in, 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 that lengthens your life may be the result of black excellence. And that's why we have to make sure that these kids succeed and uh, focus on, on uh, getting them prepared for life and so forth. Um, one of our um, employees, Priscilla says, we can also have our kids utilize the library in our community. Uh, most of you know, our Netra Burnside is uh, on the library board. And um, I know they have a number of programs that they institute and I think they're working on one now uh, for Black History Month. I haven't heard back from her yet. Um, uh, Arnetra, are you all going to have the, um, the Black Soldiers exhibit? Yes, we just confirmed the 28th uh, and I'll text you with the details. Yeah, we just confirmed it for the 28th. Okay, this is this is good news. Um, she they had a meeting yesterday, and they're going to. There's a gentleman who developed this. Um, I think Brian, you know about that. Um, yeah, and and uh, through our veterans program, that's how we met him. But he's going to be coming to Maywood and presenting um, a. Uh, it's it's really it's an outstanding presentation that he has, and he's got a number of artifacts that he has from from the, the different wars and what have you. So we're, we're excited to hear that, Arnetra. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be sending that out to everyone. Okay, um, let's see, somebody says, uh, I worked at the juvenile detention for eight years and volunteered my time on weekends, collaborating with others during Black History Month and book club meetups. Um, who's C. Johnson McNeil? I don't see them, but anyway, um, so I, you know, I think all of us can um, lift the boat. All of us can do something to encourage, um, uh, you know, for, for ourselves, first of all, I mean, read a book, you know, um, I, 
can I see the hands of people? And I, if you know how to do this, okay, if you go to, um, let's see, if you go to your reactions at the bottom of your screen, would you put raise your hand if you knew the story of Jesse Binger? Right now, I'd like you to go to reactions at the bottom of your screen and click on it. And I'd like you to raise your hand if you knew before today the story of Jesse Binger. Okay, I see one, two hands. Let's see, are there any others? Oh, I only see two hands. Oh my. Okay, so we, and, and I certainly knew about him. So that means that you can lower your hands now. Um, that means that I see there are 45 people online today. So 43 of you got educated today on the first black banker for the city of Chicago. How do you feel? Do you feel <laughs> like you learned something here today? <laughs> I even learned, I even learned um, more. So this is wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Travis, for your, um, for this lunch and learn. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, with us today. And if there's nothing else for the good of the order, I am going, oh, Sarah says partner with schools who have Black History programs, a few $20 gifts during Black History Month at a moment's notice. Any student that could sing the Black National Anthem, lift every voice in, during the month of February. Hey, there are ideas out here. Let's employ them. Let's use them. Let's encourage people to learn their history. So with that, I'm going to sign off again, Travis. Thank you so much for your presentation today and adding to our education. My pleasure. Have a good rest of the day.